Rafael Lovato Jr., the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> American Jiu Jitsu legend. Man, thanks for making Thank the time, you. thanks for hanging out. Uh, I've known you for a long time. It's been a big pleasure to see you grow up and, and, and just kick ass all over the world. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. You're out in uh, Oklahoma today? No, actually, I'm in Kansas, Kansas. Uh, Wichita. Um, there's a LFA tonight, and uh, I got uh, one of my guys fighting on the card. He's in the co-main event um, in, a, in a pretty big fight. He's fighting um, an ex-Ultimate uh, Fighter finalist. Um, and uh, so we're hoping a good victory tonight will help him get into the UFC. And, uh, yeah, just cornering tonight. Um, I brought Victor Hugo with me. He's, uh, he's living in Oklahoma now. Okay. Um, this is this is only like a two hour drive. And so uh, we've been here a couple of days and he came up with me to to help me stay in the rhythm and keep training. Nice, man. Nice. How do you compare jujitsu to MMA um, as far as like preparation mindset? What, what, are, what are the differences for you? Uh, well, MMA is definitely a lot more intense, uh, without a doubt. Um, you know, like the and the camps are much longer, you know, for MMA. My typical camp would be around 10 weeks um, for jujitsu. It's more like maybe four to six weeks on the high end. Um, and like day to day um, with jujitsu, it's, it's easy to stay positive and keep smiling and be happy, you know. Um, but with MMA, it's, um, it, it's a lot easier to kind of feel the – the pressure a little bit or the anxiety, you know what I mean? Like, okay, seven weeks, you know, and then the next week, all right, six weeks now, like you're really counting down the time. And, and um, if you don't have a great day of training, it's a little easier to kind of like, oh man, if that happens in the fight, you know, I could get, I could get hit. I could get hurt. I could get knocked out or whatever. Um, it's just a little more stressful for sure. Uh, but then I find on the day of, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, on the day of for an MMA fight, I, I was always very relaxed, very calm because it's like, it's almost like there's, there's so many variables that you have to just let go, you know, and you have to be accepting and uh, just be calm um, and trust your training, trust your instincts. Uh, for jujitsu on the day of the event, I tend to be a little more nervous, uh, actually, believe it or not, um, just because there's so many fine details and if you miss a grip or if a call doesn't go right and if it's a tournament you got this guy's game and then you got that guy's game and this guy's game you know how the bracket plays out and everything exactly. there's a lot there's a lot more to kind of keep you on edge i feel uh for mma once they lock the doors it's just like okay you know what i mean that's it let's just go um and that was one thing that i really enjoyed about it yeah that's interesting, right? Like the MMA, how crazy it is, elbows and knees to the face. You know, you have more control in that than like a jiu-jitsu tournament where you have, you know, somebody, your opponent has an easy match, the, the match before yours, styles, right? How the, how the yeah. matchups, who wins, who loses. So many variables exactly. you have control. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, man, you grew up, you grew up in a dojo. Your dad was a, you know, a sensei. Can you, can you, What's what's his background? What was his what were his his martial arts roots? How did how did that how did that begin for your dad? I'm always I never I'm always you know a big fan of you and your dad, and I just I, it means a lot to me to see that you know. What, what was it? What was his background, and how did he get involved in jujitsu? Uh, well, my dad he's an incredible martial artist. He's a lifetime martial artist. Um, he actually started his martial arts roots started uh, with boxing in Chicago. Okay. Um, that's that's where he's from. That's where he was born. And um, and he grew up south side Chicago, a very rough area. Um, and, you know, he was getting into trouble, getting into fights. And so his mom uh, got him started in boxing at the uh, at the, the boys club there. And uh, and so that was kind of how we got started. And then um, and he loved boxing. Um, he was a very good boxer. Um, and then as he got older, uh, more into his um uh, you know, uh, like high school years, he began uh, traditional martial arts. Um, of course, just like so many of us, he was inspired by Bruce Lee. Mm. And um, he moved actually from Chicago to New Mexico. Oh, and nice. um, and it was in New Mexico that he started more traditional martial arts. Um, 
And from there, martial arts was basically always a part of his life and uh, kind of keep continuing on with the, the Bruce Lee influence. Um, he began training in JKD, uh, Jeet Kune Do. And, uh, and him and my mom, uh, right after they got married, they moved to Ohio. And a couple of years later, I was born. And uh, there is a really well-established uh, JKD school in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, where I was where I was born. And uh, my dad was, um, you know, uh, one of the the main guys there. He was uh, one of the instructors, and um, and yeah, that kind of led him to Richard Bastillo, Danny Nosano, um, spending a lot of time with them, traveling around, doing seminars with them. Um, and he earned his JKD, um, instructorship through Richard Bastillo. Um, and I grew up following my dad at the JKD Academy there. Um, and the very first, well, I can't say the very first training I did. The very first training I did was at home with my dad, just kind of beating me up and, <laughs> you know, having me hit mitts and stuff like that. Um, but my first formal classes that I ever did at martial arts was inside that Jeet Kune Do school. Um, I uh, actually did Kempo. Uh, they had a, a Kempo um, uh, program for kids. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what I started with there. Um, but then we moved to Oklahoma when I was eight. And uh, basically right away, my dad picked up teaching martial arts. Um, he was a physical therapist and he was teaching martial arts at the hospital that he worked out of. And his classes quickly grew to over 30, 30 people. And, uh, and then he opened up a school and our first school was called Martial Arts International. And it was a, it was a Jeet Kune Do school. And, uh, and then through Jeet Kune Do, he discovered Jiu Jitsu um, at the instructor conferences in California. Uh, he, he found out about the Gracies and my dad's a smaller guy. Um, back then he was only like 145 pounds. And, um, and so Jiu Jitsu, you know, he just fell in love with it. He fell in love with the technique and of course, um, seeing Hoist Gracie win the UFC and being a smaller guy himself, he, uh, you know, and we just knew that that was the ultimate form of self-defense um, for for the street, you know, for for real life um, situations. And uh, and so he just put all his focus into that. He was the first one to bring Jiu Jitsu to Oklahoma uh, and really to that area of the country. He started bringing the Gracies to do seminars. And then later on after that, we uh, connected with the Machado brothers and then everything changed for us when Carlos Machado moved to Texas, um, to Dallas, Texas. And then we had, um, you know, a, a world-class black belt right there. I mean, not, not right there. It was like three and a half hours away, but uh, it was much closer than California, you know, obviously. Right. Um, and, uh, and that was it. And then we would just go to, go down to Texas um, all the time. He was going once a week. I would go when I had um, spring break, Christmas break, uh, summer, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, and the first time I went to Brazil was 99. I was 16 years old. Um, and I think I met you shortly after, uh, uh, well. like in 2002 or something like that. Um, and, uh, and that was it, a life full of travels, uh, but amazing, amazing journey it's been. Yeah, so he, was, he had a Jeet Kune Do school. And uh, what brought him to Oklahoma? Why did, why did you guys move to Oklahoma? Uh, well, um, it's kind of funny. My, my parents were just looking for a different scene. Um, you know, um, the, the housing in, in Cincinnati, uh, you know, and just cost of living is much higher. And uh, so we were actually considering moving to Texas. Um, my dad has some cousins in Amarillo. And uh, basically, they were ready to just pick up and move. They lived there for, for 10 years. Um, the first eight years of my life were there. And, um, and they just wanted, yeah, to change the scene. And they meant that the original plan was to go to Texas and they went to Amarillo and didn't really, uh, it wasn't what they expected. Um, and my mom is from Oklahoma. And so they're like, all right, well, let's just go back to Oklahoma, spend some time with your family. Um, it was summer, so I didn't have school or anything and, uh, and kind of regroup and see what happens. And so we were, we were with my grandparents and they just kind of made a, an agreement and say, Hey, if we can find work inside of a week, let's just stay here and see what happens. And sure enough, they both found jobs, um, really fast. And once they started looking at the homes there, 
you know, anyone that's been around Oklahoma, um, you know, the cost of living is, is amazing. Like your, your money can go a long ways. Um, and they've always wanted a home in Ohio. We, we only ever had an apartment. I never even had my own bedroom. Um, you know, no, like it was, uh, you know, humble beginnings. Yeah. And, uh, and so they, they really wanted a home and they got work and, you know, we could see that we could actually afford a house in Oklahoma. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's just kind of how it was. And then, you know, the Southern hospitality, the people are, are super nice and it really is a, a good place to live. Um, and that's it. We just ended up staying there. And then by the time I grew up, like I thought that one day I might move and go to college somewhere where there's a lot of jujitsu like California. Um, but, uh, by that time, I mean, I'd already grown up inside my dad's academy and, um, you know, I just, I couldn't leave it. You know, um, I, I, I was helping my dad teach since I was like 15, 16 years old. And, um, and like I said, it really is a great place to live. Um, and already having that connection to our students and kind of wanting to help my dad and, and just keep building there. What he started, um, is why I stayed there my whole life. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's funny. You, you mentioned that he, uh, he went to New Mexico and he started his martial arts over there. Right. I don't know. Who, who did he mm-hmm. train with? You, you, do you know? Um, it was in um, Farmington, New Mexico. Okay. Uh, I, I can't remember the guy's name, but it was basically a Taekwondo school. Okay, uh, okay. But the, the guy was uh, was really was really good, like uh, like national level, competitive, uh, legit, you know, um, full contact um, karate Taekwondo style. Yeah. And um, and yeah, um, that was four. Corners. Yeah, but my, my, yeah, my dad got into. Got into a lot of fights out there too in New Mexico for sure. Albuquerque, Farmington. Um, really? I know. I know you're. You, you were in Santa Fe when we met, uh, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of tough guys out there. Yeah. So it's funny because uh, the first time I heard about you, actually, it's funny. It was through. I think. I I, I think I've seen I'd seen you because I, I I think Carlos Machado brought a group down, and I think your dad was probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, you probably traveled a little bit separate like separately, like Tim Burrell and. Uh, you know, yeah, I went down and uh, I think Kathy brothers, they're probably in the mix mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, I heard about she, you, she, she used to babysit me. She actually started in Oklahoma. She's from Oklahoma. No her, way. her, her first jujitsu training started under my dad. And then she moved to um, Texas for a little while. And then eventually California back to Texas. Um, but when I would go and train with Carlos and I was a little, you know, 12, 13 year old kid, um, many times I would stay with her in Dallas um, and she would kind of, you know, babysit me and stuff, especially since I knew her from Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, we go way back. And, um, and then I think you and I crossed paths um, at Clay's. Uh, he brought Draculino out and uh, and you were there. We trained there. And yeah, uh, man, like 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, it's funny by. I lived in New Mexico and we were studying from VHS tapes and stuff, right? We're just mm-hmm. trying to learn techniques and stuff. And uh, one of my first stops, I went to LA, of course, but then I went to Dallas, Texas to train with Carlos Machado. And he was actually the first uh, black belt that I met that I ever trained with. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That, that I met and that, that I trained with as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. So at that time, he was in the Walker, Texas Ranger studio. Right, right. Yeah, so I remember. We had to walk. Remember in. the the light, the light that would come on, and we had to stop training because the they were filming, you know. <laughs> but it was like literally inside of the studio. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So that was that. Was, he was my first black belt. I I did a podcast with him, and we got to talk about it. And it's it's been uh, it's been it's been amazing, you know, to to see all all the guys and see his like promotion recently, right? To the, mm-hmm, uh, the Carabo. Yeah. So, um, um, but uh, yeah, the, the, just going, re- talking about those things, but the first, another time I heard about you was your dad bragging in New Mexico. Cause you guys brought some MMA fighters. It was before even MMA. Right. But it was like mm-hmm. cage fights. Uh, yeah. I didn't Valley, know Valley Tudo, NHB. NHB. No, NHB. Yeah. And he yeah. was bragging about you to his, uh, to his two guys in New Mexico. Like, ah, oh, my son is uh-huh. this, my son is that. Cause I think at that <laughs> point you had won the juvenile world, you know, maybe, uh, uh-huh. I, I won the Pan Ams at uh, the Worlds. I I, I medaled. I, I won a couple medals. I was in the the, the absolute finals of the juvenile in 2000. Yeah. But those are the early days. So he was he was. Mm-hmm. That's what I remember because we were like, who's who's this Rafael Lovato? 
because uh, the dad is either your dad is bragging to everybody <laughs> that he would see in New Mexico. <laughs> so it was, it was yeah. cool, cool to, I think, in the future, because I, I, I think I'd maybe seen you, but we never really met, you know, until like later. Uh-huh. 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 Well, I yeah. definitely knew who you were. Um, you know, you were, you're an OG mm-hmm. pioneer. You're one of the first to go to Brazil and, and uh, be able to win down there and really just, um, you know, kind of live the, live the life, like go all in. Yeah. And, uh, and and try to become a, you know, a, a basically a professional competitor, be, become a, a black belt world champion. Um, I remember seeing you fight in the uh, on the teams, on the, the the team championships. You know, on the o- o- OTM type OTM VHS tapes back in the day. Scotty would be down there filming, and <laughs> and uh, he he got some clips of you, and I'd be like, oh man, who's this guy? And then you know, then we crossed paths, and I followed your career. It was awesome. Man, I got I got to talk to Scotty. I got to do a podcast with him just because, man, him and Gumby, they've done so yeah. much sport for all, I think for all I, of us, right? I was just texting him yesterday. Um, yeah, he's he's doing well, man. They uh, actually Lucky Gee is is doing geese for the UFC now, so it's pretty big. I saw that. Um, yeah. yeah, but de- definitely send a message. He's he would love to hear from me. Yeah. So what was the process? You know, you uh, you started competing. You at Pan Am's. I'm I assuming went first. Uh, what was the first, how old were you when you went to Brazil for the first time? I had just turned 16. It was 1999. My birthday is at the end of June. And uh, a couple weeks later, I was heading down um, for the Worlds. Um, it was in July back then. And uh, yeah, talk about a just a, a mind-blowing experience. Uh, you know, of course, keep in mind, I'm from Oklahoma and it was the summer between my sophomore and junior year of high school, high school. you know, just turned 16 and uh, going to, you know, a third world country um, to compete in the world championships in the Tijuca Tennis Club, you know, which if you've never been there, um, I, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a shock when you go inside. Um, it's hard to, to put into words. But um, yeah, I mean, that that was uh, definitely, like I said, life-changing experience in so many different ways, just traveling out of the country for the first time, experiencing another culture, um, seeing, seeing the difference, you know, seeing uh, uh, real, real poverty, seeing the favelas and the homeless people, um, you know, speak, learning to speak another language, competing there, and just falling in love with jiu-jitsu. That's really when I kind of like just made jiu-jitsu my my life goal you know was was after my first trip to brazil and i was just like man i i want to be a champion here um the the passion the energy uh you know it was just undescribable uh watching the the best black belts at that time um you know no social media no internet no no media no no fame you know there's birds flying around and you know, yeah. poop, poop, pooping all <laughs> over, all over the place. You know, it's concrete, shirts off, drums, everyone's sweaty and just like, you know. But plumbing, the vibe plumbing, was plumbing yeah. busted in the bathroom. People were, you yeah. know, oh god, <laughs> barefoot, yeah. barefoot going to the bathroom. You, coming out, you did the not want to want to go to that bathroom. Um, but uh, yeah, it was an experience. But like I said, that's that's where I fell in love with jujitsu, and and uh, it was right right off the bat. I was like, man, my goal is to win here, you know, to be a champion here. And then the next year, 2000, um, you know, we, we got to see BJ do it. And, uh, and then it was like even more like a motivation. It was like, man, I want to be, I want to be like that. You know, I want to do it too. And, uh, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, the world's moved to the U S right. in 07. And I actually won the first one um, in, in the U S but, uh, but I always went back to do the Brasileiro and, um, and, you know, it was important to me to keep going back to Brazil, keep competing there. Um, and, and of course, try to win there. Um, it's, uh, it's something very special for me. It kind of makes me think back my whole life journey. Who are some of the first guys, uh, that first world that you watched, you know, cause I had such a big influence on me as well, watching, you know, those, those in their 97 98 like just watching i had never seen that it blew, it blew my mind you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all those like you know just so many different guys they had even from yeah the catches to the horror the graces to the ninos to the i mean you name them solo yeah you know, too. yeah yeah definitely solo nino uh margarita um 
Pejapano, uh, goodness, Comprito, Tedede. Tedede was definitely one of those that I was like, I remember when he won, he had the blonde hair. And, uh, and I was like, man, who is this guy? And I remember hearing about him as a brown belt. Um, and then the next year he beat Nino and, and uh, won as a black belt in his first year. Um, the, the Vieira brothers, uh, Holeta, Holeta was a big influence as well. I actually did a private lesson with him one time. Uh, it was either 99 or 2000. Um, I also got to do lessons with, uh, Ricardo Laborio. He was, um, he had a little school inside the Baja beach hotel. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, one yeah. of the, one of, one of the levels, um, like the 15th floor or whatever he had a little studio in there and uh, in a small school and we were staying in that hotel and okay. and uh, me, me and clay Pittman and the other guys we all did a uh, group private lessons with him for a week um but uh, of course he was he was a uh, just a little bit before the time i started going down there but he was he just started fighting in japan and or he had one fight in japan but he was going with uh, all of the btt team fight team um yeah yeah but uh, man, so many, so many could go on and on and on. Um, you know, the, 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 the greats, you know, back then they were just, that they paved the way for, for all of us today. Yeah. Who did you go down with the first time you went down to Brazil? You went down with your dad? That's no, believe time. it or not, my dad never went. No my way. Dad, he, he doesn't like to fly, man. He doesn't fly. Um, like he, huh? Like yeah, he. he <laughs> he uh he was in the air force actually um when he was younger and uh he actually lived in spain for for uh, a couple years um he was stationed there um but uh he had a bad experience and uh, after that he he was not a flyer and so all those times that he was going to california um to to learn jiu-jitsu he was driving no. and he he competed in um and the was it, it's either 96 or 97 pan ams and yeah he drove and he would stay a week two weeks and then drive back and i i did that trip with him a couple of times um and he wouldn't stop he would just pull over in the and the little truck stop and take a quick nap and then hit the roads again uh, he would go straight through like 21 22 hours straight just boom um but uh but yeah so you know he he it's his own little bit of stubbornness and every now and then, like for my London fight, you know, we were able to get him to fly, but he's got to kind of get drugged up a little bit to, to make it happen. Uh, but for the most part, he doesn't really fly. And so back then I was just going with the guys, you know, and the other thing is we didn't really have any money, you know? And so the little money that he had, um, you know, he just invested into me, you know, and something that, uh, I'm just so grateful for, you know, um, and my mom was so supportive and, and uh, everything they had, he put into me to allow me to travel, um, compete, learn. And then I would come home and show him everything that I learned. And uh, we would drill together and I would take notes and ask questions. And, you know, and we would just go over all the information that I would come home with. Um, and that was our process. But, uh, yeah, he's actually never been to Brazil. Um, and he's only been to Europe a couple of times um, in all these years. Uh, he did one Europeans with me. And uh, he went to my title fight in London. Um, but, uh, yeah, basically all the traveling I did, I was just with the guys. Who would you go with down there in the 99? Uh, the guys from Texas, the, the Machado team from Texas. Who was it, who was it uh, uh, Clay Pittman? Uh, um, Clay Pittman, Travis Luter, uh, the DeFranco brothers, Tim Burrell. Um, yeah. And they had a good – Anthony Paroche. Um, you know, the Machado team back then for, for Americans was very strong, very, very strong. Yeah. Um, you know, Hegan, Jean-Jacques, um, even Carlos was still competing a little bit and, uh, they were, you know, um, uh, really great teachers and, and the, the Machado team in California was, was strong. Texas was strong, but, uh, you know, the, the guys were meddling at the worlds at blue and purple belt, like a couple right. of them did, did really well. Anthony Paroche, Tim Burrell, Travis Luter. Um, and, um, and to, to win a medal at the worlds back then as a gringo was, it doesn't matter what belt, it didn't matter what belt. If, if you, if you won a medal, it was a big deal. You know, at, at the end of the tournament across all the divisions, it would be a handful, like five people right. from f five gringos would manage to get on the podium, you know, across all the belts, you know, 
uh, and we always knew who, who, where, who they were and where they were from. Half Gracie had guys that would always do well. Uh, the Machado guys, you know, you, um, you Garth know, Taylor, like, Garth Taylor, Garth Franca, Taylor. Yeah. Claudio Franza and then Paul mm -hmm. Schreiner, uh, after Yes. That. Mike Weaver uh, was a part of that group too. Henzo Gracie. And then, and then guys, yeah, nice. Henzo's, exactly. And then a few years later, it started like Lloyd Irvin and, right. uh, you know, he, he would bring Fowler and Ryan Hall and then it became JT, you know. Uh, but in the early years, man, it was, it was tough, 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 tough. People, you know, nowadays they don't know how lucky they are to have all the jiu-jitsu here in the U.S., have all the access, all the world-class guys to learn from and be able to, you know, train basically full time with the best, um, you know, uh, that's all they know. You know, they don't, <laughs> they didn't have to go to Brazil, you know, and uh, get their ass kicked as much as we did, you know. Um, yeah, th those days were, were pretty tough. You know, it's interesting because you're, you know, you're, you're young, you were young, you're a kid basically, but you you had that, you had the old school experience, you know, going down to Brazil and really, really living the life, you know similar mm -hmm. to, to my to myself um and uh and um what is the difference of learning jiu-jitsu back then compared to now you know you lived in a year in the u.s what's the difference uh of learning then to till now like um well for me it, maybe my my journey my process is is different like when when we first started learning jiu-jitsu keep in mind my dad coming from the jkd background mm -hmm. um you know, everything was about real life self-defense, you know, um, it was, uh, you know, very much a, a martial artist mentality, uh, mindset. Uh, we were martial artists. There was no sport. Uh, when we first started learning jujitsu, we didn't even know that there was a sport, you know, that there was competitions. Um, it was more like, okay, this is what you have to know for a fight, you know, uh, because, you know, 90% of the time you're going to end up in a clinch and the safest place you can take the fight is to the ground. It's always reality based, you know, and um, and that's what I grew up in. Uh, and that's really what inspired me to do MMA later on in my career. Um, you know, but we when like the only time I ever did no gi, for example, whenever whenever I was a kid, if we ever took the gi off, it was to do MMA. It was like, what, what other reason is there? You know what I mean? There was no point to do jiu-jitsu without the gi. It's like, if we're going to take the gi off, we're going to put on little gloves and, and do MMA. And, uh, and that was the only time I ever did no, no gi, you know, was MMA. Um, and all the jiu-jitsu training we did was with the gi. And, uh, and, you know, it was just very much like, uh, you know, focus on the, the classic, the classic jiu-jitsu, you know, the, 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 the fundamentals, the basics that everyone just knows as the basics um, that was really much the style, uh, then, you know, that I grew up in, um, because that's what would work in a fight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it wasn't until years later did get more and more inspired by the sport of jujitsu, you know, um, you know, going into the early two thousands when things started to become, um, bigger. Um, and, uh, and nowadays I think a lot of people start training for the sport element uh right right away uh, very early on um and uh and they don't do as much of the the self-defense um and uh, you know i don't think they're very few people are ever taking the gi off and and putting strikes into their training you know and understanding what that's like what jujitsu with strikes feels like and and uh and all that kind of exploration um that was very normal for for the time that i grew up in um, because like I said, everything was, was, uh, you know, a complete martial arts spectrum, you know, it's like, you couldn't, you couldn't just know jujitsu, um, all the way until I was like 18, 19, 20 years old, um, inside my dad's school in order to get a blue belt, you had to, you had to do striking as well. You had to know self-defense, you had to do, um, Muay Thai. And, uh, and when you tested for your blue belt, um, you know, at the end of it, uh, of course, we would do jujitsu rounds, but then at the end of it, everyone would have to take their gi off and actually do MMA rounds in order to get a blue belt. My dad was such a, a firm believer and and just, um, you know, almost stubborn in the in the fact that he did not want one of his students. He didn't want them. 
he didn't want to not feel confident in their ability to protect themselves in the streets if, if, if they had to, you know. Um, and so back in those days, you know, that's what I grew up in. I was always doing MMA style stuff, um, you know, as a kid. Um, but all, everyone that got a blue belt from us was actually like a pretty, a pretty decent level. Like, uh, I, I would even say, you know, I mean, at least amateur, of course, but a lot of them could have fought professionally on a regional level, you know. Um, and so that's kind of the difference, I think. And then, of course, uh, going to Brazil um, and traveling around, it was really hard to get knowledge. It was really hard to find people that would really, you know, teach you. Um, Brazilians, uh, you know, they, they tended to kind of look at us as outsiders um, back in those times. And uh, it was hard to, to come across one that would be very open and generous with teaching us the details and the, the game, you know, and that was one thing about you that I remember early on is like, you knew how to play the game, you know, how to score, how to control the lead, how to have the strategy inside of a jujitsu match. Um, and for a lot of Americans, we always struggled with that. Uh, we would want to go and train basically and, and think of it as kind of like the same way we would train every day, but it's not, you know, um, and Brazilians, uh, being that they had so many more tournaments and access to higher level training than us, they were so much sharper on the gameplay. And, uh, and it took me years to figure out how to play the game. You know, uh, it really wasn't until I, I started training with Salo and Shanji that I was able to develop that understanding of strategy. You know, I had no strategy. My strategy was just to go and go, you know, whatever happened, happened. Um, you know, I learned my, that, you know, I learned my strategy from <laughs> who's that solo. Oh yeah. Yeah. He I, was the best. I never, I never trained with him, but I was obsessed with him. I read every single interview. I read, mm -hmm. I watched every single match they did like obsessively. And he mm -hmm. took out every single guy. Most of the guys were the Gracie Baja guys, you know, but he took out every single guy, took them out of their, what they were best at. Right. And so even though I never trained with him, I had, I finally had the opportunity to, to, get on the mat with him and train with him. And it was like, he's, he's kind of like the goat for me, you know, cause he's done just so yeah. much for me. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to kind of share that with you, you know, since you brought, no, just yeah, yeah. you're but totally he right. Guy, he, he was the first guy to game plan and to have strategy mm -hmm. and tactics. And he's like, yeah, mm -hmm. I can be better than me, but I'm still going to beat him. Yeah. 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 He, he knew how to, uh, how to play each person accordingly, mm -hmm. you know, and neutralize and, you know, n never fall behind. Um, whereas, you know, back in that time, like, especially for Americans, we didn't get it. And you would end up right in inside someone's best positions. And you could never, you know, never score, never get going. Um, and if you fell behind, you know, especially a brown belt and up, you know, it's impossible to come back. Yeah. Um, nowadays, I see that everyone knows how to play the game you know, uh, and like even blue belts, like blue belts know how to play the game. I and belt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally, totally. And so it's, it's a lot more professional in the sense that um, if you're not competing all the time and really know your game and know your positions and how to play, um, you're going to have a very hard time just jumping into a tournament and, and winning, um, especially at the adult level. Um, and so, you know, the, the amount of talent and the amount of just like, um, you know, sharpness. Everyone is so sharp across all the belts. Um, you know, anyone that's winning blue could already be a great purple and so on and so forth. And so you gotta be, uh, you gotta be a stud and you have to start young nowadays if you're gonna win at the adult level. Yeah, that's it. And you mentioned Chanjay, like strategy and, and game planning and tactics and all of that, you know? I'm always curious on mindset. What did training with Saul and Shanji do for your mindset? How did it, how did it change you? What made you, you know, from a certain level, make you rise to? It gave me confidence. Oh. Um, it, it was all about the confidence. Um, you know, I, as a brown belt, it, that's when I, I met Saul. I actually fought Saul um, and I was just 19. Keep in mind, I, the first time I went to Brazil a few years before, you know, he was the, the legend. Um, he was already multiple time, you know, he was the man. And, right. um, and I watched him then as a kid. And then a few years later, I'm fighting him. 
uh, as a Oklahoma kid, you know, brown belt. And, uh, but it was amazing. And, uh, you know, he brought me in and, and gave me the opportunity. And, um, and it really felt like destiny for me. Um, you know, uh, at that time, I was still under Carlos. Mm. And Carlos had started a family at that point, And he wasn't, he wasn't really traveling. I, ha- I didn't really have a team going with me or any support. I never had a coach um, at the big tournaments. And I was just very much on my own. Um, and remember, my dad didn't really travel either. So, I mean, uh, most of the time when I competed, I, I literally was by myself um, or I would just make friends along the way. And, uh, um, you know, like I said, I didn't understand the game. I didn't I didn't know I didn't know what that difference maker was. And, and my uh, I had I had losses. You know, I I lost uh, my first year as a brown belt. I went 50 and 50. You know, I won. I lost the same amount of matches that I won. And um, and so my confidence started getting rattled a lot. I was like, man, am I am I ever going to be able to do it? You know, am I going to be able to become a, a black belt world champion? Um, and then Solo, you know, did took you, me did under you medal, his. Did you medal at the adult blue, purple, uh, brown? Up I, to that point? I did medal at blue and juvenile in purple. I did medal uh, at the worlds. I never medaled as brown. I was I was so close. I made it to the quarters. Um, but I did medal at the world cup, uh, you know, which isn't the, the world's worlds, but it was almost the same back then. Um, and, uh, in my second year as a Brown belt, I, I won two bronze medals. Um, and I actually had eight fights. I fought Gal Val in the absolute semifinals as a Brown belt. And, and I beat a lot of good guys, but like I said, I was, I wasn't gold. I wasn't on the top. And, uh, and I didn't know what was missing, you know, and then I started training with Solo and Shanji. And, and then right at that time, 2004, Shanji was starting to become Shanji. He wasn't, he started to become not just Solo's little brother, but he was becoming his own, own, own person. Um, he won the worlds that year in 04. He got his first world title. He made it to the semis of the absolute. Uh, he did really, really well. And, I trained with him all the way through that season, every day. Uh, We did that whole season together. And, and I'm like, man, I'm doing everything he's doing. um, And he's winning, you know, and same thing with solo. Uh, And I I really came in a special time. You know, you kind of mentioned it earlier about the timing, how everything happened. Uh, I got to see jujitsu really in its roots, you know, still in Brazil and then, you know, come in uh, and, 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 get close to the Hibeto brothers when Salo was still in his prime, just at the end of his career. And then Shanji starting to make his, his mark. And I got to be there for, for that transition and, uh, and everything Shanji won, me and him won, we won together. And, uh, and then of course, see now where Jiu Jitsu is today. So the timing, everything has been very special for me. Um, but just, yeah, you know, I started kind of almost living with them. I would go to Ohio where they were at the time. Uh, in Toledo and I would spend weeks at a time there um, doing camps for Pan Ams for Worlds uh, and really just doing everything with them ADCC uh, and then they moved to San Diego in 2007 and of course you know I was there with them through all of that Um, I'm like man it's like uh, I'm doing the camp with them Um, you know Shanji and Salo they're both telling me look you know like you're 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 there you're ready you know and Salo taught me how to kind of take everything that I had in my mind working against me and use it to supercharge me. You know, uh, it's all about that, that, that self-talk, you know, what are you saying to yourself? And it used to be, uh, you know, Oh, I'm an American. He's Brazilian. You know, he's this guy, he's a legend. He, you know, because we grew up idolizing, you know, those greats, you know, and then next thing you know, my first year as a black belt, I'm fighting Margarita multiple times. I'm fighting Pejapano. I'm fighting, you know, these guys that, you know, Solo, you know what I mean? Like uh, that for, for me, it was like, all right, I'm going to try not to get submitted. I'm going to try to give them a good match. You know what I mean? It was the, the, the self-talk. It wasn't that I was, I really saw myself on that level that I could beat them, you know? And he helped me take that, that whole like, journey you know of an Oklahoma kid and 
and not having an instructor in my, in my state and all the hardships and everything that I kind of had like working against me, like, Oh, well, there's no way I can beat this guy. And instead turn it around and be like, yeah, my journey has been this hard and yeah, I'm from Oklahoma and yeah, I'm this and I'm that. And I'm still going to beat you, you know, because I deserve it. You know what I mean? And I, and I'm going to work hard and you can't, you can't stop me. I'm not going to quit. And, uh, and it just started to make me more mentally tough. And I learned how you had to make a switch. You know, you can't be the same person that you are every day when you step on the mats, you know, you have to be the superhero version of yourself. The one that has no doubt, the one that is unbreakable and is, is, is mean, you know, you got to be meaner, you know? And, uh, and Solo really taught me that he got inside my head a lot. He was really hard on me. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people may have heard stories. He could be super intimidating back then was really, really hardcore. I mean, we would train for hours and he would just kick my ass and just kind of, he was hard, you know, but my dad was hard. And so I was used to that. Um, and then once I started winning, it was like, I got stronger and stronger and then, it all worked out. And then, you know, I, I had my, my grand slam year and it was all like each one gave me more confidence, more confidence, more confidence. And it was just like Salo said. Yeah. Yeah. Gold, uh, grand slam, Brasileiro, pants, worlds, and, uh, and uh, what's the Europeans. Europeans. Europeans right. So how important is mindset? It's everything, man. It's everything. Out of 100%, how much is mindset? Well, it's hard to put a percentage on it because there's, there's the other, you know, your, your routine, your, the lifestyle, your preparation, all that has to be right too. You know, it has to be right. And they go hand in hand. How can you have the, the confident mindset if your preparation was, you know, was not there? Um, but at the same time, your preparation could be perfect and your mindset's off a little bit and you fall apart. You're, you might get hurt and your, your preparation wasn't so good. You had to deal with some adversity, you know, uh, things in the camp, you know, maybe personal things that uh, can be hard on you. And maybe your preparation wasn't as good, not, not on purpose, not on purpose, but because of things out of your control. Yeah. But if your mind was there, you can still perform. You know, you've seen it so many times and I've experienced it firsthand on on amazing levels, you know, where the camp was terrible. <laughs> but my mind was in the best place it could have been and and everything still worked out. And a lot of times when things are going wrong inside your camp or inside your preparation, it's to help you make your mind stronger. Because then you have to identify right then, you know, what is your why? What's your purpose? What are you fighting for? Are you going to stay tough? Are you going to see it through? You know what I mean? And if you do that already in your camp, when you show up on game day, you know, you're, you're, you already, all those questions have already been answered. And so if you end up in a, in a tough situation uh, on game day, you're all, already prepared to get through it, you know? Um, and, uh, and so you know, uh, of course, like I said, the, there are two, two pieces that need to be connected, but this piece cannot be perfect. And if this piece is perfect, anything's possible. You mentioned your whys. What were some of your whys in your, in your competition journey? When the, when, the, um, when the going got tough in a match or training or preparation, what got you to the other side? Well, in the very beginning, it, I, I think for everybody, it starts kind of a little, a little selfish, you know, it's like, well, I want to be the best. I want to be a world champion. You know, um, that was my, my life goal was to be a black belt world champion. Um, and, uh, and I was able to achieve that fairly early on, you know, when I won the worlds, um, I had just turned 24, you know, so I'm still young, you know, I still have many more years and I actually had to really think hard about what my, my, uh, my new objective was, you know, more or less like, because I had already kind of, I didn't see past that, you know, and I only, I only ever really thought of winning once. Mm. I didn't put it into my mind that I was going to try to win multiple times or be this or be that. Um, 
And so I had to really kind of re-identify what it was that, that inspired me. And, and it definitely came down to a couple of different things. Number one, I wanted to be a, an inspiration for, for all uh, non-Brazilians, especially Americans, you know, and, and kind of say, look, like it's possible, like we can do this, you know, because of the time that I came up in. Um, and even still to today, you know, like at the, at the black belt level, you know, we're, we're, we're very far behind. Um, uh, of course, there's so many more um, great, great non-Brazilian competitors that are at the top. But, but as far as who's getting gold, you know, it's just a few. It's still only a handful, um, you know, after all these years, you know, and I won in 07. And it took 10 years later before another American won gold, you know, um, or non-Brazilian won gold. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to be an inspiration. I wanted to say, look, I'm from Oklahoma. I never had a black belt instructor in my home. Um, and, and look where, how far I've come, you know. So kind of just let everyone know, hey, it's possible, you know, and, and come with me. Let's do it. You know what I mean? And, um, and then, uh, of course, family, like my father um, and our, our journey um, in Oklahoma and everything that we've been through, um, you know, uh, more and more and more, uh, as I got older, I, you know, you look back at, at everything your parents did for you and, um, you know, I just appreciated it more and more. And it's like, I, I wanted to make history for us, you know, and, and just, um, you know, create a legacy that started with my father. Um, he actually had a heart attack in, in 09 and, uh, and I, you know, 07, I won. 08, I was in the finals again. So I had two really great years. I won the Pan Ams both years. I, I was really on fire right then. And, um, and I had a knee injury at the end of 08. And I'm coming back in 09. And uh, just coming back after almost a year away from competitions because of my knee injury. And then my dad had a heart attack. And, uh, and 09 was a tough year. Um, you know, he, uh, he couldn't, he was basically stuck at home for six months in his recovery. And he, uh, he actually had the heart attack inside our school. Um, so he literally almost died on the mats, you know, and, uh, and I saw that and it, it, it totally changed my life, um, you know, in so many different ways. And that's when I, I started running the school on the business side of things. Um, and, you know, he, uh, at that time, like, you know, we, we, we were uh, world-class on the martial arts side of things, but on the business side of things, we were very far behind. And, you know, he had no, no things in place, no systems, no ability to retire. He was a one man show. And when I came in and I saw like, man, he's literally gave so much blood, sweat and tears to create this amazing world-class martial arts, not just jujitsu, but martial arts, academy and facility uh in the middle of nowhere you know um he's like at that time a switch kind of went off it's like he doesn't deserve this you know he should be able to retire and and just live his life and and so then i came in and i started running the business um and then i so then i'm now i'm juggling being a, a 25 26 year old competitor and and running a school um and, and the next year i took it over officially um, just because we were all worried about my father's health and wanted him to not be so stressed. And, uh, and then that gave me a whole new inspiration, honestly, um, you know, to just create a better life, um, for my family and, uh, and take the school to its, its full potential, uh, on, on all elements as a business, um, and be able to, you know, have hundreds of students, um, and, and then it was more about like, okay, I want to change lives. I want to inspire. I want to make an impact. Um, and, um, uh, and of course I still wanted to win titles, but, um, at that point now I'm, I'm not just the young competitor anymore. You know, now I'm, a, I'm the business owner and I'm, I'm the leader now, you know, my, my dad was kind of the leader before, uh, but now I'm the leader. And so, uh, I, I grew up fast, you know, and, uh, and it was just, okay, let me set the best example for my students. Let me make an amazing school, uh, help my family, and, um, and lead by example. Yeah, thanks.
the your transition to MMA. Just want to kind of touch upon that, you know. So you you know you're at the top of the food chain, black belt, to winning everything. Um, you I'm not sure when when did you start fighting MMA or what was what was that what was that like? How did that begin? You know, for for me, King of the Cage came to New Mexico, and I had my black belt, and I was like, oh, you know, I want I want to test myself out, you know, Let's see if this stuff really works, you know. And I, at the time, I was definitely representing jujitsu, so I wanted to <laughs> represent jujitsu as well. How was it? How was it for you? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> touching on my background already, you know, so you know what I what I came up in, um, the the the, the martial arts upbringing that I had. Once we got into jujitsu, that gave me the first, you know, uh, sport platform to compete. And, uh, and then I fell in love with it. And, and of course, like I said, I wanted to make my mark and, and, uh, but I always knew that one day I had to do MMA. you know, I, it's like, look, look at my upbringing. I was made, I felt like I was made for it. It was meant to be, but, um, but, you know, once I got my black belt, I, I didn't, I stopped training uh, the stand-up martial arts. I stopped sparring as much, you know, but growing up, I always did, did stand-up and I always did MMA training. My dad had a fight team, uh, back then. And, um, uh, and, but, you know, once I was a black belt, I was like, okay, I got to focus on winning the tournaments. Uh, and I, and I went away from doing, I would still play with it. And, and we had some fighters and I would still help and train with a little bit, but I was always doing tournaments. And so I didn't have that much time. Uh, but I knew one day I had to do at least one fight. I had to do at least one. I had to know what it felt like. I had to experience the challenge. I wanted to test myself as a martial artist, you know, um, and put put my whole life into into one. Um, and so I waited a long time. You know, I was uh, older than what I thought I would be. But uh, at the end, like, I'm really happy I did what I did because there was no what ifs there was no like ah what if i would have stayed in jujitsu da, 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 da. i gave everything to jujitsu i gave everything so i was already uh 30 uh turning getting ready to turn 31 and uh and i was like you know what now's the time i'm not quite as inspired anymore for jujitsu not that i wasn't inspired but right i wasn't i wasn't always inspired you know right. i had my days i had my moments where the opponent or if i was in brazil or something like that where I was like super pumped, but then, you know, it was the same events that I was fighting the same guys. I'd already fought everybody over the span of multiple generations. And I was like, it's time for something different, you know, and I'm 30 years old now it's time to switch. And so it was 2014. Um, and then I just turned 31. Um, and then I made my, made, made my debut and, um, and it was good. And I liked it and I liked the challenge. Um, and then I got hurt right after I tore my, my pec. Mm. Um, and I was stupid. I, I fought. And then a week later I did a jujitsu tournament. It was stupid. <laughs> um, and I didn't get hurt at the tournament, but I just, I never took a break. Yeah. And, uh, and then I was like, Oh, now I'm going to compete. I, I was actually going to compete at a Morris. Oh. Um, and, and I just, I went right from MMA camp, MMA fight to jujitsu tournament jiu-jitsu camp for another jiu-jitsu fight no rest tore my pec in training um and i was out and then that was the first time i had the pause button put on in a really long time and uh and then that next year was 2015 and it was the first worlds i didn't get to compete in um in basically my whole life you know um and i and i sat there and i watched and I watched Bushesha blow his knee out that year. That was the year that Bushesha hurt his knee. Huh. And, and I had just hurt, you know, just had my surgery, first surgery of my life, you know, and I, and I was still unsure how I was going to come back, how I was going to be competing again. And I saw Bushesha get hurt literally on the mat with 10 other matches going at the same time, you know, because it was absolute. It was Saturday. And, you know, he's not getting paid, no insurance, nothing, da 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 and he's just over there in the corner and he blows his knee out. And I'm like, man, that's our best guy, you know? And I, that just something happened where I felt like, man, you know what? I, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to just be another person on the mat risking my body for arguably nothing. You know, uh, I felt like I'd already made my mark. I had made my history. 
And I finally, I finally let go at that moment. I was like, you know what? I don't need to do this every year anymore, you know? And it's time for something different. And at that moment, I was like, you know what? I, I want to fight again. And, and I want to see what, what, what can happen. And so then once I healed, I had my next, my second fight at the end of that year. And I started to kind of like, hmm. And then Legacy said, hey, we want you to fight for our title. And I was like, oh, a title. And I, keep in mind, I'm on TV making making money, you know, and I mean, it wasn't, it was legacy. It was a smaller show. It wasn't, that, it wasn't great money, but it was still more than what you can make in Jiu Jitsu. And then, uh, and, and it was a, it was a show, you know, it was a real show. You weren't just one guy, one match going on the mat with many others, you know, the, all the professional events that are out there today weren't, weren't around then. Right. And, you know, there, this was before flow grappling and everything else. Like it just, it wasn't happening yet. And, uh, and so then I just, uh, all right, I'm gonna go all in on MMA. And, uh, and after I won the legacy title and I got to like have, you know, my dad was in my corner for my fights and, you know, I, I fell in love with the way MMA brought my whole life together. You know, my dad's in my corner, Shanji's in my corner. I have my Muay Thai coach, who's also someone very close to me. He's one of my jiu-jitsu black belts. Um, and he's, uh, just an amazing martial artist. Uh, my wrestling coach, my strength and conditioning coach, and these guys are my students too. You know, my wrestling coach is also one of my black belts. Like literally all the most important people in my martial arts journey, in my life, would all come together for my fights, you know? And it, it's impossible to get these people together, you know? Like they're only going to get together for one of three things. I always joke about this. Either someone's getting married, you know, God forbid there's a funeral right. or – or it's a fight. You know what I mean? Like, that's the only way you're going to get all these people to come together. And, uh, man, we just started having so much fun. And I fell in love with being a, a student all over again and learning and growing and, and the challenge. It was a whole new challenge. And I was down here and I could see, OK, this is where I'm going, you know, and, and jujitsu. I hadn't I hadn't had to climb that mountain in so long. And uh, and so I got hungry and it made me feel young again. And we were on a mission and, uh, you know, we just, we just took it all the way and it was a beautiful, beautiful ride. Amazing, man. How many, how many total fights did you do? 10. 10. Okay. Yeah. The Masasi fight was my 10th fight. 10th fight for the title, for the Bellator title. On paper. Yeah. Congrats, man. It's amazing. You know, it's, uh, I was, you know, I was following you. It's of course, you know, uh, and then just to ha finish it off like that, you know, is, is, uh, you know, it's just inspiring, you know? Um, thank you you know and it's amazing to see you know you coming from the old school growing up but you're a, you were a kid so like right. you're you're younger but you've also experienced that old school like i want to call it the golden era but at the time yeah. when all these jiu-jitsu guys were also fighting valetude and mma at the same time right the murilo bustamante right. and the, you know you name them right fabio grigels mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. so amazing man man tell me about what happened you you you, you retired after your 10th fight uh, what happened? What was that? What was the diagnosis? Uh, I'm not too sure on, on the, you had a brain. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let, let me clarify because, um, uh, Bellator put out like a press release. Um, they, they let some fighters go and they, they kind of, and they put me in the list of retired fighters. And mm -hmm. I, I never officially retired, retired. What happened was, I couldn't get approved anymore uh, from the commission. And so um, I got forced to the sidelines, but I haven't given up hope. What happened, London, my, my title fight with Musasi last year, was the London was the first commission, the first location that I had fought in where they required a brain scan. Hmm. Uh, up, up until that point, I had never been re required to get a brain scan done. A brain, brain MRI. And, yeah, right yeah, exactly. And, uh, and of course, I've never had any issues, never had a concussion, uh, never been knocked out, never like, for the most part, all my fights went very, very smoothly, uh, never, never took too much damage at all. And I so I never had a reason to get a scan done otherwise. But now it was required. Okay, so I, I go get my scan done so I could get approved for the fight. And inside that scan, while I'm in fight camp, um, we discovered that I have a disease in my brain. It's called cavernoma. 
or CCM. Um, and what you get, what it is, is you have these, they call them angiomas. And they're like collections of blood vessels that group up and kind of wrap up together, almost like, like vines. Mm. And they collect and they have the tendency to bleed. And depending on the location and the size, when they bleed, it can cause problems, obviously. Um, you know, uh, c- common side effects are uh, people, you know, getting paralyzed or losing, losing uh, feeling in one side of their body, um, vision problems, um, you know, having seizures, even going into coma. And worst, worst case, wor- case scenario is death. Um, and so I discover this while I'm in a fight camp, I'm literally six weeks away from my title fight. And, you know, uh, now I found out I have a brain disease, you know, a condition in my brain. And I'm just like, I, I'm like, I'm a mess. You know, I'm like, what? I you know, I just couldn't believe it. And, uh, so I'm, I'm dealing with processing my health and in knowing that I'm about to fight. And of course I'm about to fight Musasi, a legend, who was a huge favorite, you know, he'd already had 50 some fights. He's the champion. He'd, you know, been on a big win streak and, and I'm, I only had nine fights, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, there was a lot of things to, to deal with. And then beyond that, I wasn't approved, you know, I, 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 I couldn't get approved with this brain condition. And so I go on a whole process, seeing all these different doctors and, and, uh, you know, trying to stay positive while I'm training for the fight. And just, man, I, I can't even begin to describe how hard this time was. Uh, I talk about it in depth on the Joe Rogan podcast that I did earlier this year. Um, but bottom line, I found a doctor who's, who was positive and, and for me, continue fighting. He wrote a letter. Blah, 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 blah. I send it in. I'm going through the process with the commission back and forth, back and forth. They don't want to prove me that, you know, it's like 50, 50 and I'm still trying to train and get ready. I didn't know I was going to fight Musasi for sure until two weeks before the fight. They said, okay, we're going to let you fight. So we fight, you know, you know what happens. We're able to win. Two weeks before they, they approved you. Two weeks before the fight. I finally got approved. I literally got approved. And then a few days later flew to London. Like wow. it was all up in the air and <laughs> until the very, wow. very end, man, until wow. the very, very end, it was all up in the air. And hey, that doesn't but, know how it's training when you're not sure you're going to have a fight, how hard that is. Wow. Oh, and, and keep in mind, every punch that I'm taking in my sparring, I'm wondering like, oh my God, is this going to be the one that makes all of this go wrong and puts me in a coma? You know what I mean? Like I had no idea because I, I hadn't really found any good specialists yet to really help me understand my condition. And, uh, and so I was a mess, man. I was, I was literally crying every day. Like it was terrible. And I'm like, how can I come so far about to do the fight of my life, the, the, you know, my life's work, everything. And maybe it's not going to happen, you know? And, Man, like I said, I was a fucking mess. Sorry to cuss, but it was it was hard. The only way I got through it is I had Shanji and my Muay Thai MMA coach Mauricio with me every day, like basically hugging me and lifting me up and keeping me keeping me somewhat okay, you know. Um, but we got approved, and so at the end, I kind of had a little burst of like, okay, it's going to happen. And going back to what I was talking about earlier about the preparation maybe not being perfect because of things outside of your control and how that can actually work into a good thing. You know, every, every adversity carries with it the seed of an equivalent advantage and that's told. Yeah, exactly. And that's totally what happened. Totally what happened because everything that I did to keep fighting, to get approved to fight, you know, that was the hardest fight was just to get to the fight. Right. And not com- not completely fall apart and just give up because I had doctor after doctor after doctor telling me no. And and we just didn't give up. And we literally kept seeing more and more and more and more doctors until I could find one that said, yes, it's OK. I'll write a letter for you. And uh, and so that's you know, that was the key to the victory, man. I already knew 
I, I knew everything. I knew exactly what my why was and, and I, and I didn't quit. And, you know, just getting to the fight was the fight. And so when it came down to that fifth round, you know, it just, I was ready for it. I was, there was no question, you know? Um, but, uh, but afterwards I, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, okay, well, they approved me. So now everyone's going to approve me. You know, it's like a precedent. I'm good. I'm good. Well, turns out Europe kept studying my scans and they actually made a panel to talk about it because it was so rare. You know, it's a, it's a rare condition. It's like one in 500 people have it, which isn't that rare when you can think about how many people are out there. But, but then when you talk about one in 500 who also happen to be professional fighter fighting for world titles, you know, then it's like super, okay. Very, very few people, if any, you know, I think I'm the first one that ever had to had a world title and, ha and has this disease. Mm. And so they keep talking about it. And then I already signed to do the rematch in January of this year. I'm in camp in November and I get a call from the European commission and they say, Hey, look, we've continued to study your exams, your, 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 your pictures. Um, all the doctors here have now come to the conclusion that you shouldn't have been allowed to fight and we will not approve you to, to, to fight here ever again. And I'm like, wow, oh. you know, and I had already signed for the rematch in California. Mm -hmm. And I talk, I tell Bellator like, guys, I'm super concerned. California is going to say, no, we need to put everything in there now because there's no way I can go through another camp, not knowing. And it's still early. Let's, let's make sure California is going to say yes now. So then we start talking to the California commission, get new scans done. I see a specialist at UCLA. The specialist at UCLA says the same thing that the specialist in Brazil said that he didn't see it was a problem. The risk, the locations of my angiomas are really good. And the risk was less than 1%. I still don't have any symptoms. Keep in mind, I'm totally healthy. I don't have any, any symptoms that, that would let me know that I have this condition. And, uh, and so I'm like super positive. I'm like, yes, I cried again. My, my coach, my manager, we were all together when we saw this doctor and we all think, yes, it, it's going to, it's going to happen. So Bellator takes it all, gives it to the California commission and they talk about it and we're waiting and we're waiting and it takes them like two weeks and they come back and say, no, we're not going to prove you to fight. Um, and then I'm just like, you know, I'm, and keep in mind, I have not told anybody. I, I didn't even, my parents didn't even know yet at this point, I didn't want to continue fighting and not, and then, and then be worried. You know, I didn't want them to know and then be worried or, you know, anybody. And so only a very few people knew. And, uh, and so now I have to like, I started lying and making up stories. Oh, no, the fight's postponed. It's not going to happen in January. And I take like a month through the holidays and I'm literally just like trying to figure out what am I going to do? You know, now I have two commissions saying no, Bellator has no idea what to do. They don't want to, they don't want to assume the risk. Um, you know, they don't want to put me in some, small state, you know, where I'm not going to be required to send them an exam uh, of my brain, you know, and, and there was this whole confusion and I'm just thinking and thinking, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I end up meeting with Bellator in January and, uh, and, you know, they were super supportive and I'm just like, guys, look, I need to come out about this. I need to, I need to get it out because at this point it's been, you know, seven months, I still haven't defended my title and there still is no fight announcement yet, you know, and people are asking me and, and I'm like lying to everybody, including my family about what's really going on. And so I tell Bellator that I want to go on the Joe Rogan show. Uh, I had that opportunity and, uh, and that's where I let it all out, you know, and that literally was like therapy for me. I, obviously I was very emotional, but that was the first time that I got to get it all out and come clean as to what was going on. And, uh, and from there, it was basically like, look, I can't get a commission to approve me up until now. And so 
I'm going to be on the sidelines. And, and I didn't want to hold up the division um, being the champion and not being able to defend it. And, and so I basically relinqu- relinquished my belt. Um, now, <laughs> if I knew there was going to be a pandemic a few weeks later, I wouldn't have done that. Honestly, I, I wouldn't have done that because everything stopped and it would have given me time to continue to try to figure something out. Um, but whatever it, it happened. And I just now have been able to go start seeing doctors again. And, uh, and I'm still getting good news from the specialists, the, the people with the most experience with my condition. They say that they don't think it's a problem and I should be allowed to continue fighting. And so it's my goal, my goal to present this new information that I have to the commission and hopefully get approved to do one more, at least one more. You know, I want to go out on my own terms. It wasn't like, like Khabib, what just happened. Khabib got to go out on his own terms. I know it looks, you know, oh, you're the champ, you retire or, or whatever. You, you had to quit on top. But I wasn't ready at that moment. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't ready to let go. I had all these plans. I wanted to fight in big, big arenas in Japan and Madison Square Garden. You know, we worked so hard to get to that point. And then it was taken, taken away. And, uh, and so all I want is one more opportunity for my team, my family, for us to go out on our terms and say goodbye, you know, our, our way, you know what I mean? Uh, we, we never, we never had that chance. And so, um, hopefully that, that can happen next year. I'm going to take everything that I have and I'm going to present it to the commission, hopefully, uh, early next year. And if I can get approved, I want to fight at least one more time next year. Yeah. I know it's a long story. Sorry, just no, no. It's it's, it's a lot. Of I, I want to want to clarify, you know, because a lot of people don't understand when what the timeline was and, and how how it all went down. And just I can't I can't help but it's it's like a whole lifetime of martial art mindset. Like to I mean, just even to get that that first fight with Musasi, you know, and then yeah. to continue the fight, you know, it's like, you know, that that's crazy craziness, complete craziness. I want to just ask you one, one more question. What is your favorite moment of your career? What's been your favorite moment? Oh man, it, it's hard. I, you know, I, uh, several times I'll get asked that in, in podcasts or interviews or whatever. And, you know, I can never say that the number one, because at every point in my life, you know, that thing or that moment was, was the most important or was the most special, you know, it all had, it all had a, a, a special meaning, you know? Um, so it's hard to say, but I mean, of course, nothing, nothing as far as the, the magnitude and everything that I went through in that camp, you know, and being a huge underdog fighting on enemy turf, you know, in Europe against the legend like Musasi, um, you know, if I had to say, and, and that I had my, my dad and my quarter, my family and, and everything like, that was, you know, um, probably the, the one that, you know, if I was going to say is the favorite that that would probably be it, but, but everything was special. And, and, you know, the times I competed in Brazil and I won the Brasileiro and, um, you know, winning the worlds, of course, the world, that was my first life goal that I ever set for myself. Um, you know, they're all super, super special. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to put it into, a category of what's the yeah. most, but, uh, but yeah, th- those memories, man, that's, that's what it's all about. Like, yeah. Uh, looking to my side and seeing my family and, and uh, knowing everything that we went through and, you know, sharing, sharing it together. Um, that's, uh, that's better than any title. What a journey. What a journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. I learned so much. Uh, just, I didn't know the, those early days, you know, where you went and you went to Brazil by yourself. That made, that made a lot of sense. That's why I never saw your dad. Yeah. <laughs> when you're a dad, you know, but what a journey between you and your dad and just your, your whole life, you know, wow. You know, and then this whole thing with the, at the ending, I, I didn't, I, I need to watch the Joe Rogan podcast to, to, to learn more where you go into detail. Um, but uh, congratulations, man, on an amazing career. And uh, just you're an amazing guy, you know. You do great work in the community, and I really look forward to visiting your your school one day. And yes, please I, do. Hopefully, hopefully, I'll have the honor of you smashing me again, and, and your guys, you know, <laughs> bring, oh. bring the heat, you know. 
I call it violent hugging. It's, this is my, <laughs> my, 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 way, my way to give love to everybody. <laughs> but it. no, man, I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so much respect for you, man. You're you're one of the pioneers, a legend, um, and you know a lot of people don't know that you were you were on that podium. You know, you 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 achieved what so many of us thought was impossible um, at one point in time. Um, you know, at the what 2002 Worlds, shutting it out with Fetosa and the guys, um, and uh, you know, so much respect and, and thank you for inviting me on. It's uh, great to talk to you and catch up. I look forward to seeing you as well. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you for the support, guys. Thank you.